Thank you so much for sticking for this last uh, piece presentation. Uh, I'm happy to introduce my coworker Dan. We both work at Firmer, but um, me and Brian are focused on memory. But I do interact with Dan on a regular basis, and he and uh, we have a lot of people doing that. And actually, that's like, in my opinion, that's a bit of like invisible job that is by all means necessary. So and necessary to achieving our company's goal, which is sustainability, <laughs> if you have not heard about that before. Please welcome Dan Kowalski. Um, all right, so my name is Dan Kowalski, and I am a rather opinionated firmware engineer at Ampere Computing. Uh, sometimes that's to my own detriment, but the talk we're going to go around with here today is using open source to power the sustainable cloud. And we've heard a little bit about it for those of you who've sat through this room. Um, what does a sustainable cloud really mean? And if you look at our current trends for consumption of data services and, and features that we want, you'll see there's a steady curve going up. To supply that data and information though, data centers have had to come up and come around through the world. They're getting installed all over the place. There are predictions in worst case scenarios that the consumption of debt power by data centers by next year will be 10% of the actual power the world can generate. That's a significant amount of power. That is a worst case scenario, mind you. But if you look at what's today predicted, which is about three to 4%, that's a significant growth over the next year. And so we have to kind of do something a little different about this. And we at Ampere said, we think we have an idea. So you might have heard of our name mentioned a bunch, but here we are. Who is Ampere? Ampere is a company that builds an ARM-based SOC. And with that comes a server. We've had a couple products that we've launched, uh, one called the Ampere Ultra, one called the Ampere Ultra Max, and finally the Ampere Ampere Watt, which has been uh, a fun experience. Um, you may ask, all right, well, we've heard about it, where can we go use you or where have you might have been able to use our stuff? And, you know, you could go rent some time at any of the cloud service providers like Oracle, Google, Tencent. There's a whole link over here with a bunch of them that you may want to use. But you might have used it without even realizing it as well. We've got a, We've been supporting open source for a little while. So, for example, if any of you develop with the Zephyr RTOS, the CI at Zephyr, Every ARM uh, build runs off of an Ampere Mount Collins system. You might have used it through an entirely different piece that we would call the OSU OSL. So Lance over there waving his hand. They support a couple dozen different projects that do have Ampere hardware behind them. FreeBSD, as we all heard earlier, we have donated hardware to the FreeBSD project to help support the ports and packaging systems. Uh, LLVM for one of the compile farms, right? So it is there. It is being used to help move ARM64 development along. So what does it mean, though, to be an ARM server? We're going to kind of do a very fast review of what is known as the Neoverse design. I'm calling this Neoverse design at 1,000 miles per hour. We're going to gloss over a ton of details for the little bit of time we've got here. Uh, Ampere's designs follow the Neoverse, the ARM Neoverse design. We started with the N1 series, and what that means is everything runs on what's called an application core. That is an ARM V8 or an ARM V9 core at the top. Only there are lots of them. In fact, this diagram shows there's 64 of them. By ARM's definition, there are 64 of these altogether, and then they all get meshed together at some level. They're all connected, they kind of work to give you this massive chip. Uh, but ARMS, or Ampere said, we think we could do something a little different. So we customized those ARM V8 and ARM V9 cores a little bit. And we also said, looking at the workloads of what we want to do based in servers, we think you're going to do better with some higher core counts. So you'll see on the Ampere Ultra, we've got about 80 cores. On the Ampere Ultra Max, there's 128 cores. On the Ampere One, there's 192 cores. And then as of just the other day, there's this lovely little snippet on the left. Yeah, that's the left side for you. 
Oh, I guess that's your right side. Sorry about that. Uh, we've announced the new Ampere Aurora with a 512 core system. Right? The core count is going up dramatically, and this has some impact to us. But the idea here is with these core counts, we want to still keep the power consumption down and get you the performance level that you're expecting out of something from like x86 or from uh, PowerPC or any of the other chips that you might be following. But we're still not done with our neo-diverse design. Blah, sorry. Underneath all of this, there are two little ARM v7 chips that actually are used to power up the entire system. And so overall, this is kind of the, the fast version of the neo ARM neoverse design here. And this is what you'll find in our chips and how things work. Now, having silicon alone that runs a little less power isn't just enough, right? Other, without software and proper software at that, it's just expensive sand, right? It, it doesn't do anything. It's not useful. So we have a software stack that goes with it. And I'm kind of breaking this down to two different areas. One I'm calling the visible software area. And this is where you, as an end user, are actually going to go be able to see the effects of the software, right? You, you interact with it, you do something with it. There's a less visible area where a significantly smaller group of people will go interact with it. And so in the visible software, we've got things like operating systems. This is the thing you're gonna load and run and do whatever you want with it. Uh, you're probably gonna work with a compiler as well at some point. You need to build your software, et cetera, et cetera. On the less visible side, there is firmware, the boot firmware that gets run on that platform. There's a packaging and signing process that gets used to generate the boot firmware package that you're going to work with. There are things like the BMC and the debuggers. And we'll, we'll walk through all of these rather quickly because we don't have tons of time. But uh, the idea is we want to make sure all of this stuff is available to you and very functional as a free and open source process. So from operating systems wise, you know, there's proprietary ones. We're not really going to go dive into those. There's very little use to talk about that here. But Linux distributions, the FreeBSD, et cetera, et cetera, our absolute goal with our operating system side is to make it boring, to make it not noticeable by any of you. Right? There should be no issues with installing the OS. There should be no issues with configuring it to run. And if there is, we've done something wrong. I know, for example, I have a, at home, I have a uh, Orange Pi 5 Plus awesome little device. But if it wasn't for the efforts of, say, the Armbian or, uh, I know I'm going to screw up his name, Joshua Reek's uh, Ubuntu repository, I would never have booted this system. It takes too much effort to try and put together my own distribution or own image for this. And this is my hobby box, right? If you're paying several thousand dollars for a server and you've got to go through this, you're done. This isn't going to work. Our goal is to make sure you can boot the Linux operating system or FreeBSD operating systems without any real efforts. It should happen easily. Now, there are some challenges with that statement that go with it. Uh, oftentimes, we have to match our or worry about product launch dates versus a, a release date for the kernel or a distribution cutoff date where they want to make the next version. We don't want to leak early features, but we want to make sure you are enabled with the bare boot behavior. After the product launches, of course, uh, say Ampere Ultra launched or Ampere Ultra Max launches, any new features we want, we can then go work to get them upstream as fast as possible. Usually they're ready and waiting in the wings for the, pro for the actual uh, product launch time. Uh, compilers, and this is actually the really interesting one because compilers are kind of an edge case for us. Uh, GCC and LLVM slash client, those are really the only two compilers we, we really worry about, right? And we want to make sure that you can compile your code to get the most out of our hardware. If you are using this hardware upstream or in a cloud service provider, you're charged by the minute. We want to make sure you get through that as fast as possible so you can do whatever it is you're needing to do. Keep your costs down. Uh, if you're really interested about more on the details on this, there's a link here to a talk by our lead compiler architect, Kevin Smith. Uh, in collaboration with ARM about how compiler optimizations really do impact your uh, performance capabilities. And that's from, I think, 2019. 
uh, ARM Developer Summit. So it's a, it's a really interesting talk if you haven't listened to this or really dived into compilers. But here's the funny thing. By the time the product launches, we need to have these pieces into the compiler because of the side effect of once that product launches, you're going to have lots of sites go off and do performance metrics on things, and they're going to go compile the code. So everything needs to be ready to go in there. And here's the fun challenge that we have. When you put that code in, there are some really smart people out there that can decompile or decode what you've done for the supporting that platform and figure out lots about your platform well before it launches. So for example, the folks at Chips and Cheese over here did a very interesting decomposition upon some uh, commits that were made to the LLVM compiler and determined what kind of architecture was going to be, how big of pipelines pieces were going to be on a product we hadn't launched yet. Now, they make some speculations on it based upon things, and that's great. It, it's, inter it's a very fascinating read if you haven't done it to see how they decompose those commits to come up with this, this design. But we need to have these things in so we can have the performance metrics on product launch. All right. So back to that Neoverse design for a minute. We're still walking through the software stack and talking about stuff. Um, and our goal, again, is still to make sure we get these pieces up in open source so you can go use them. In the boot process for one of these Neoverse designs, you start, you push the power button on that hardware, and the ARMv7 powers up. That is the very first thing that comes online. In our case, this is an RTOS. Right? We use a real-time OS in the, as of Ampere 1. This turns the lights on, brings the house up, gets things in order, and then it releases the very first single application core where it loads what is known as the TFA, or Trusted Firmware A software. This is the bootloader that is used for all of the application cores. It goes through its steps, builds a secure and a non-secure world, and powers on all those other application cores where it suddenly throws into itself the UEFI implementation that is designed to be loaded. The UEFI implementation then walks through its steps, and you're probably used to UEFI from your laptops or your desktop machines that you've worked with. Once UEFI gets to a certain point, it loads the actual operating system, and the OS takes over on all those application cores. That's kind of the boot process, and when we talk about firmware, we are talking about this entire process here. Now, there's key things about making these open source for us that we want to, I wanted to highlight here. First is the ARM v7 RTOS. For us, this code is proprietary. Unfortunately, we cannot open source large portions of this. Uh, we are built with the Zephyr RTOS, though, and we have used what they call the T2 model. So it's an out-of-tree module from Zephyr. What this does allow, though, is for us to say anything we need to change in the kernel or in the Zephyr tree itself, we make sure that gets pushed upstream before we do anything. So for example, uh, a great example we've got is the, uh, the PL011 UART driver. If you read the specification, there is one way to read it. If you read the specification with just a minor twist on one section, the upstream PL011 driver does not work for us. That minor modification is how we, our hardware engineers, have interpreted this spec. So we have submitted that change back upstream. There's nothing wrong with sharing that kind of change. It is a a K config for the Zephyr kernel at this point, right? We put the effort into making some of the things like uh, we needed little FS to have read-only capability to shape, save some binary space. We've implemented that upstream. We're still contributing to the upstream process to make everybody's efforts work or everybody's use of these technologies much better. But we can't give away all of the pieces that we're working with. That doesn't mean we're still not active in the the, the project though. So for example, we're also active in the working groups. I've been the release manager for one of the Zephyr releases and I'm active in the release process today. We've had people active in the security mod or security working group within Zephyr. Um, it, there's more than one way to actively take part in this open source project than just contributing code. But as we move to Ampere 1 and we move to this RTOS, this actually became the a very big catalyst for us within Ampere to move away from private uh, interfaces, private IP, into using lots of other open source projects. So for example, uh, 
Actually, I think it's the next slide. No, it's not. All right. Um, once you've got into Zephyr, it's very easy to start being like, oh, there's feature X. We want to use that. And then they've got something that's close to what we want on feature Y. We just have to do some minor modifications of it, and there we go. It's a very slippery slope, and this started to extend as we were working on Ampere 1 into other areas. Um, and we'll go into a lot more of them, one of the more interesting ones in just a moment here. The TFA, as we talked about, this is the part that launches the application processor course. Currently, this is all proprietary. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, our goal is to try and upstream and open source large portions of this. We're struggling to figure out how that's going to work right now. So I don't have a time frame on that. I don't have any ideas when we're, we'll get there. But that is our goal. And hopefully we get there soon. Uh, there is a UEFI layer to everything, as we talked about, once all the application cores come up. And UEFI is rather interesting because it has got a specification, which uh, you can go read about here. And as far as I can tell, it, it looks like it's an open specification. Uh, you can go read it. The license looks like it's pretty open. Still not a lawyer, so don't, don't come after me, please. Um, and then there are implementations of that specification. And one of them that we use is EDK2. Uh, or sometimes called Tiano Core. And uh, Tiano Core is a historical name for it. EDK2 is what we mostly reference it as these days. Previously within Ampere, there was a large focus on using uh, proprietary ED or UEFI implementations for everything. All of our tests, all of our builds, all of our internal development. When we moved to uh, uh, the Ampere 1 platforms, initially there were only three of us working on the firmware for the entire product. And we made the conscious decision to use as much of the open source tooling as possible, and we inserted EDK2 into this process. Today, when you're doing your development, EDK2 is now the primary development vehicle that we work with, partially because we didn't have the time or resources to go figure out how to make the proprietary one work in the environment we need it. EDK2 is really well documented, really well covered on how to put it into, say, a containerized build and how to get it working. And that's where we ran it on this. Uh, our goal with EDK2, of course, is always to bring things back upstream. And so if you look online today, the Ampere Ultra family is upstream in the EDK2 code. In theory, you can build your own version of the EDK2 libraries for your uh, Ampere products. We had it. For a while, we had it forked off to a different location because we didn't quite match up to the upstream requirements for coding. Uh, we cleaned that up, and now you can see it's uh, the second link in here to the EDK2 platforms directory. Ampere 1 is the current product line, and we're working on trying to figure out how to upstream that right now. Um, I expect it will go rather soon, but again, it's a priority call of getting the products out the door versus getting the support there. Uh, now, I said, you, in theory, you could publish or build your own EDK2, and this is where things fall apart on this. Packaging and signing. All these firmware pieces have to go into, essentially, a Spinor image. And that Spinor image needs to be signed. None of that signing process is something that we can open source. Uh, a very good reason for that can be seen with the recent secure boot bug that's been found. We don't want to be the next secure boot bug similar to that. We have to figure out how we can share those cryptographic keys, or if we even want to, to enable the boot. So why am I bringing this up? Well, we had a little bit of a win within the company for doing this. The Spinor previously was a custom file format that you couldn't go look at. As of Ampere 1, it's just a GPT image. And the, the, the details at the top are really, that is a dump. That is an F-disk dump of the Spinor image. You can see the partition. You can go loop back mount any one of these partitions and walk through it and see what's in there. It's actually really nice for debugging everything on us. Uh, even better is the fact that we can just look at the UUID to find the partitions we want. Those UUIDs don't change. And when specs need to change, they need to change the size or the volume or anything like that. It's only updated in one little spec area rather than having to go through and fix it in all the pieces of the firmware that need to go read the spinal. This has been a huge benefit for us on achieving some velocity on development and not breaking everybody at any given time. Um, let's see. 
All right, so now we get into the parts that I'm not entirely con comfortable talking about. So feel free to ask questions and make me dance up here. Baseboard management controller. For most of you, this will mean absolutely nothing, but it's known as the BMC. On your server, there is this little board on the side that has usually an A-speed 2400 or 2600 that has essentially an embedded Linux on it. It can be other things too, but for the most part, everybody runs an embedded Linux variation on it. It has fingers that go all the way into the rest of the board and it can do things like read sensors and report back uh, certain data like fan speeds or temperatures. And it does things like turning on and off the platform for you remotely. It does things like updating firmware, right? All these pieces are controlled by your BMC. There are proprietary solutions for the BMC. And there is this one that's called OpenBMC that has been pushed by several other big industry companies big industry players to become the standard. And we do support OpenBMC. In fact, our goal is again, to make sure this is supported in upstream BMC, OpenBMC before the product launches. Uh, why? Because a lot of our downstream providers use it fork of the BMC, the OpenBMC, to create their own proprietary versions. Now, oddly, internally, most of us don't develop against OpenBMC. We all develop against the proprietary one, which confuses me because I'm one of the people that still doesn't use the open source one. I just grab a machine that's under development and say, whatever, I don't care about the BMC as long as it's working. I'm trying to debug firmware at any given moment. But I would really like to see us as a company move more towards using the OpenBMC for our internal testing and our validation as well. Uh, partially because the proprietary one is a few weeks behind the OpenBMC development. One of the challenges though that we have is a lot of the patches we've done for OpenBMC aren't, aren't generally acceptable for upstream BMC functionality. And so we maintain our own fork of it. You can find it here and help find the details that you want on it. it. And some of the reasons that it's not acceptable is because we've focused really on what Ampere's needs are and not what the, the global answer would be for making this feature work. Uh, and that comes down to the schedule pressures and designs. Right? It doesn't mean that we aren't trying. We will come back and when we get time, we have come back and added some pieces to it. You'll see we've done contributions to the tree as well. The team working on it has been really pretty awesome about the whole process. Now, here comes the fun part with debugging. This is probably the thing none of you will ever, most of you will never get, the few of us who are from Ampere in here, get to experience this a lot. Internally, we are heavily reliant upon a proprietary solution known as the Lauterbach Trace32 system. It's an amazing system. I, I, I really can't say anything else about it. The open source o, uh, OCD, open OCD, sorry, system works almost as good though. The nice thing about it is the open OCD requires an Olamex JTAG connector. It costs, 40 bucks, maybe 50 bucks for something like that. Lauterbach, there's a couple zeros missing to make that happen, right? Um, and for the most part, everything we do within the company, we're looking at registers, you're looking at a stack trace, you're looking at uh, uh, wanting to break at certain points. Open OCD does amazing at these sorts of things, and there's no reason why we can't make more use of it. Uh, we've contributed a lot to it, I mean, we've been trying to keep uh, some new features that Ampere debugging has needed. For example, we uh, collaborated with Mellanox to add watch points to OpenOCD. Uh, the ADI v6 DAP edition were first published by us. And while the, my understanding is the patch wasn't accepted, it was the piece that started to getting people moving towards using the v6 version of the ADI. Before that, everyone was still on it for uh, v5. And, and we've got some challenges here. I call it slow process because I didn't really know better how to do it, or how better to word it. We, uh, we have to keep moving forward with our products and some of the time it takes to get the code reviewed for not just open OCD, but other pieces, it, it really impacts us and makes it difficult to do things. So we maintain a tree, and how to, uh, oh, sorry, not a tree, a fork of the whole thing with our specific changes that we need. One of the most awesome changes though is we are a server company. Our devices are designed to go into racks of servers. I would love to show you a picture of a rack of servers, but I can't do that at the moment. 
Um, when you put a device into the rack though, it's really hard to go add in an external device like a JTAG debugger. Two of our engineers have figured out a way to use Open OCD and Open BMC together so that we can do JTAG debugging without the need for an actual JTAG. And when you combine these two for us, any of our rack systems, we can go in and remotely connect to them without needing to have a JTAG debugger attached. And you can walk through it and do the debug sight unseen, right? It's wonderful. I, I can't stress it enough. Otherwise, we've got to reach into our, our lab team and say, pull rack 43 out, put it on the, the bench, and you're waiting hours to days for this sort of thing. And then you have to hope that they actually plugged in the JTAG debugger properly. Right? They fall out, they're, they're top heavy, they, they fall out of the system, blah, blah, blah. All right, so th this is kind of what we're looking for when we're talking about making, bringing back to the open source of the sustainable cloud. We're trying very hard to bring our pieces of firmware so all other people who are coming behind us with ARM servers can leverage a lot of this work and a lot of this understanding and make it more open. Um, at the end of my talk, there is this QR code that I was told by, by Brian to add here that will bring you to, I believe, the ARM64 community, ARM server com developer community at Ampere. Yeah, so I, I only found out about this yesterday, so I don't know, use that to your own risk. I'm told it's very nice and benign, but uh, feel free to go that, that way. Um, but I do open it up to questions. As I said, I'm opinionated on firmware, so if you have questions about that, I'm also welcome to go for it. What's your question? All right, so let me try to summarize the question there. You're asking, what is what are the gating issues of moving the rest of it upstream overall? And with the, the signing portions, why, what are the blockades on that side? Is that a good way to summarize it? Yeah. Okay, uh, moving more of it upstream, the challenge has been some things like IP related. Um, for example, the DDR initialization section, right? We're not gonna go give you the secrets to the how we initialize DDR. Um, that's something you, as a, a manufacturer of your own product, are going to have to figure out on your own. Um, sorry, but we invest a lot of time in that. And uh, there's other little pieces that we don't want to release just yet, like what is the uh, communication channel that goes through for a secure boot just yet, right? Security through obscurity is not the best solution. You can easily go figure that out if you really wanted to but we need to figure out how we can better harden it before we do some of that. Um, why not the cryptographic keys? I would love to answer that question. I don't know the true answer to it other than there is some concern about uh, if we need to do a recall, what happens and how that works. So that is really the, the, the stumbling block that we've run into. And I don't have, I'm not part of those discussions to really give you a ton of detail on it, but that is my understanding is that if we have to do a recall, what key do you trust? Where do you where do you go from? Other questions? Go for it, Tita. Yeah, I, I have a kind of an engineering question. I guess you know this engineering. Sure. Um, Why do specific registers, at least far enough aware, are not available uh, in the uh, to the open 
the kind of one to say like what a particular register value is and like why it's important. When you're when you're saying register value, you mean so if I'm a change like so if there's like a default setting um, in the firmware, mm -hmm. and I change that to a change, um, it, or for better example is I get it onto a system. Um, I'm on a campus server, and I am not sure uh, what if if settings have been changed. Mm -hmm. um, I am at least thus far unaware of any tools available to check the register value of user versus user. Okay. And most of the time, it's something that would be available um, in the OS itself. Um. All right. So let's see if I can rewind this a little bit to explain it. Uh, the question is really within a, when you're booting the system, there are customizable tunable knobs that we have. And you can change those via the BMC. Why is there not a way for the operating system to know what those knobs are? Is that a proper? Okay. Um, part of the answer is because the operating system isn't aware of them. They don't exist to the operating system. Again, we're back to the statement of, we want to make the OS boring. You should not have to think about any of these sorts of things. So these are not knobs that we generally expose to you. We do expose it to the rest of the firmware, and we do expose a way to customize it for an individual site um, but, or a customer of any kind. But it's not something we want the operating system to go report back. Some of them are. For example, uh, you can disable certain core counts. Right, or certain cores in the boot. And that is something the operating system will see. Like, oh, we've only got 126 of the 128 cores available to us. Uh, that's something you can decide as a, a user. Some of these are also values that get reflected in UEFI boot. So when you're at the UEFI boot menu and you're scrolling through you know, the, the customization screens and you change things, you'll see the default and you'll see the current value that it's set to. But not all of them are things that get touch there. The, the knobs you're probably talking about, and so for those of you in the room that don't realize this, Tito works at Ampere as well. So uh, when he's talking about an SRP, this is our release package that we send out on a regular basis. I can't even remember what SRP stands for at the moment, but um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you're probably customizing for the, the kind of run you're doing at that moment. So that's not something we generally expose out to the operating system for those reasons. Does that help answer the question or? Yeah, okay. All right. Right, it's been exposed only this much and that's what it's gonna to have to know. Otherwise, we'll have to have you do something within your booted operating system, say, oh, we gotta disable these two cores. That, that becomes too difficult, that becomes too challenging. There's no value, there's no benefit for you as an end user, right? We want boring. Boring is good. Remember this, right? Boring is good for anything server-related, installation-related. In fact, you heard the guy, the FreeBSD gentleman earlier today, if you were in this room, talking about just stop with installers. Just give me an image to go run and put on there. It is all done. It just make it easy for everybody. All right. Other questions? So what do I see as the future for open source at Ampere? And what more do I want to see it doing? Uh, I would rather see... Ampere right now has a very active role in a lot of hardware specifications. Um, and that's great, right? It helps us get what we need for features and functionality in the hardware. I'd also like to see us a lot more active in the software implementation of those specifications. Because English is hard. In fact, English rather sucks as a communication method. I'm going to be very honest about it. Uh, it's very easy to misinterpret how somebody says something. There's a lot of nuance to the language, to the way things are written and spoken. And implementations depend upon written versions of specifications. 
if you weren't attending the actual call where that specification piece was written and discussed, you may have missed an important detail. And we've seen this time and time again through specifications and tons of hardware, right? So having us active in the upstream development of many of these projects, I think is going to be essential for us to ensure that the specs are written to the way we need them and then the implementation comes the way we are looking for them to be implemented. UEFI is a great example, right? Uh, but beyond that, there's we, we have folks involved in the PLDM specification. This is something that we use for communication between the BMC and the host firmware. This allows us to disassociate. In the past, we've had to time a BMC release with the firmware release because they were in lockstep. We've moved to using something called PLDM, and this is an open standard that you can find on the OpenBMC website. Uh, sorry, GitHub links. Um, and PLDM allows us to do not work in lockstep. It sends a version. It has identif identifications of what features and functions it supports. So now the BMC can be any version we need it to be, and the firmware can be rolled forward or backward for testing or whatever your customer may want. And the, in theory, the data can be presented to you. In practice, we're finding it works really well. So having folks involved in the PLDM development, uh, the DMTF organization, which defines things like uh, the communication channels that are working over these low-speed I.O. devices. Uh, these are really important places to have us active in it. Even more so, Embed TLS. This is a cryptographic library that's an open source cryptographic library from ARM. Having us walking or monitoring that and contributing back to that for some of our security features would be really useful. OK, go for it. Oh, go for it. I'm wondering if you could speak just a little bit the nuances between proprietary software and developer software. All right, so the, the question would be uh, how how did we, as a small team, what was the, the challenge of working with the proprietary or yeah. some of the Some of the problems that were solved using the open source tools. Um, one of the big ones I can say right off the bat is that uh, the open source community is quite useful. Uh, if you run into issues, it's very easy to go find answers. Right? Uh, I don't understand why this is happening. And you can reach out to the mailing list, to a, a Discord, an IRC, whatever the group has. And oftentimes, you'll get a lot of answers that are really useful. I mean, you still get the answers of why are you using X? Go use Y, and those get frustrating after a little while. But uh, there's a lot more support for finding answers quickly for you. And it's easy to see the history on why these changes came into play. You can look at the Git history on it, on that change and say, okay, this is what used to be done. This is being done here, and here's the commit messages why. Uh, the archaeology on the code is really pretty easy to go do. On the proprietary solution, you've got a dump. Here it is. That's it. Um, one of the other challenges that we ran into early on is, and this is a one that infuriates me all the time. Uh, a lot, a lot of times, the proprietary code you come and compile it. There's warnings, uh, a lot of warnings, and it's hard to tell what is something that you've introduced versus something that's been there before. I'm a very big fan of the if there's smoke, there's fire concept. Right? If a warning is coming out of the compiler, you've already done something wrong. You should probably go fix it. Um, and that gets frustrating for me as somebody who has to look at this and recompile every day, multiple times a day. I don't want to have to spend the time figuring out, was this something I did or did not add to this process? So th those are two of the big ones that we've run into. and. The, there's multiple others I could probably walk through, but hopefully those give you enough of an idea why we, we jumped on using something that was easier, or perceived easier, I should say, at the time. Have you looked into a name?
I don't know the actual answer to that one. Um, I would have to look into that. So, yeah. <laughs> Why, what, what issues are you running into? So uh, Lance is asking about, okay. Okay. I don't think there's a good question. But I think it's a great question. Who is that actually running it? Right. I mean, I personally find it annoying that you see on the website, you know, this is a great solution for their life. Oh, see, one of the things we get from a lot of customers is using uh, the ability to do a flash through an IPMI command. And that is one. Yeah. Right, and that is something we use a lot, even internally. We want to reset these 20 machines, IPMI command to this 20 IP addresses, and here's the file we want to go do. And you just kind of walk away and let it do its thing for however long it takes. Um, but I understand the question, and using the standard Linux firmware update process would make some sense. Well, I'd have to check with the Linux kernel team that we've got to see what their what their feedback is on that. I use it on my laptop here all the time. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it until you mentioned it. So sometimes that's all it takes is somebody saying, hey, why not do it that way too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, you can certainly read up more about the Neoverse architecture. Um, if you type into your favorite search engine, ARM Neoverse design, you're going to get a lot of pages. There's a really great design or documentation on it through uh, Ars Technica. Um, but ARM also has lots of documentation on it. Um, but the Ars Technica folks have kind of dumbed it down a lot to make it consumable by the rest of us who don't want to read pages upon pages of uh, technical details. So was there another question? Uh, so All right, so I think the, the question is, what what does open source help to mitigate security-wise for us? Okay, um, so for... Is firmware addressing security? Okay. Um, part of the design of our system is there is a secure and a non-secure world, and the two shall never cross, right? And and that is by design. Uh, so things in non-secure can't go access the secure world, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the realms are very important for making this happen. Security-wise, though, one of the nice things we've got is uh, by using open source software, we do have things like long-term stable builds. So for example, the Zephyr Artos, we've been on the 2.7 LTS for a long time. Uh, the TFA code has just moved to the recent uh, LTS code. Right, so we get support and we do get vendor, not just vendor, but uh, owner, I guess maintainer supplied fixes for things that we can pull into our tree as they get found. And we can make the determination uh, if they are necessary to be brought in or not. Um, for example, there's been a, a bug that, a security violation or a security bug that was recently introduced or found in GCC that affects uh, ARM v7 compilations. Do we really want to go upgrade our compiler to fix those pieces? It's an open question. Uh, since we do everything through Zephyr, we have to wait till they update their compiler upstream, and then we can pull those changes in. And they've done some mitigation. That's part of the part where we've been talking on the security uh, working groups with them about whether this really matters or doesn't matter. Uh, so we do get value from that. Right? The security side on various pieces does fall, uh, flow through, and we do monitor and watch a lot of those pieces. Uh, some other areas, like uh, the operating system side, obviously, when there's a fix and they do a kernel rev or a disk rev or anything like that, we end up walking with it and taking it with our, our efforts. Does that answer it? All right. <laughs>
No, it's it's fine. All right, any other questions? All right, that brings us to 45 minutes. So thank you very much.